So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the New Normal webinar number 47 in our series. Um, who would have thought it would have got that far? And uh, a really exciting one today, looking at startups and looking at really exciting, cool stuff. Uh, robots that climb walls, which uh, I'm fascinated about. And really great that we've got Jack, uh, the founder of the company, on with us. So if you're just joining us for the first time, welcome and uh, great to see you and uh, hope you enjoy it. If you're here from a regular, then uh, welcome back and uh, thanks for continuing to come. As always, if you have any questions, if you want to know anything, please enter in the chat box and we'll we'll ask the questions to the panel or we'll answer them or we'll express the opinion, which is what you may offer as well. So with that, I will hand over to my co-conspirator, Shahid Latif, who will talk us through the agenda for today. Thank you very much, Steve. Welcome everyone. Uh, as Steve has said, uh, number 47 in the new normal webinar uh, schedule, and we're very proud to this week introduce Jack, um, who will give his bio and his background in a little while. Um, Jack is going to be talking this week about climbing robots. And, I well, he'll explain more about why that's important and what a great innovation that is. And, you know, technically, from my um, humble interest, I, I'm fascinated by how you can make what is a relatively heavy thing defy gravity and actually go vertically up a structure. So, you know, we'll explain a little bit more about that during the webinar. So we'll go through uh, the new normal webinar, the background and history for those who are not familiar is we started this uh, journey back in March, April of last year, when the first lockdown took effect. Um, Steve and I are very keen on building a community. We're very keen on uh, self-development and acquiring new knowledge. And of course, uh, doing that in a way through the webinar enables us not only to achieve our personal objectives, but also to share that journey with our community, the new normal webinar audience. So. It's a great learning for us each week. We acquire lots of uh, new and interesting insights into society, into technology, into business and retail in particular. But at the same time, we get to meet wonderful people like Jack who are working very hard to develop some new innovation and bring that to life in the marketplace and to get the, the, the traditional ways of doing things challenged because there is a better way sometimes and technology can provide that answer. And so we will be fascinated to go through that with Jack today in today's webinar. During the webinar itself, as always, we encourage you, please do take a look at the bottom of your screen. You'll see a chat icon, press on the chat icon, and then you can enter your comments, your observations, your challenges and questions. If you're intrigued uh, by anything that you're seeing, please put a comment in and we'll share it with Jack and the panel. Um, Steve and I will be monitoring that as we go through the webinar. Uh, at the end of the presentation, the webinar presentation itself, we'll walk you through the resource page. The resource page, again, every week we produce not just the video recordings, which you can access in the repository, which we, you'll be given a link to, but the resource page is also a document which gives you further insights, further links, video links, document links, white papers on the subject for that week. It's a way of sharing more knowledge with you and giving you an opportunity to dive deeper into the subject. Uh, at the end of that, we'll share with you what we hope will be the next week's webinar topic and hopefully encourage you to join us. And if you enjoy each week's webinar, please by all means share it with your colleagues, invite others to the new normal webinar. With that, if I may, I'll, I'll hand it back over to uh, we had a, a quick debate about who's Ant and Deck in the relationship, but apparently, was it I'm Ant? So I'm handing it back to Deck. It was somewhat, somewhat height related, I think, was yeah. something around it. But uh, yeah, anyway, as falls to me to uh, set the context for what we're going to talk about. And uh, we wish, when I first met Jack and we were talking about robots, I still had this sort of belief that every robot had to be look like a bloke and look like C-3PO and those sort of people, uh, those sort of things. And of course, they're not. We encounter robots in all sorts of different walks of life. And uh, so I looked up the definition 
And it's any automatically operated machine that replaces human effort. And especially for me, it said that it may not resemble human beings in appearance or perform functions in a human-like manner. And you know, Jack's business has developed and they've innovated and they've got these robots that climb up walls that we're going to talk about. But you know, we all work with robots that are uh, you know, the car washers that we see as, a, as an example. We see, you know, we talk about robotic process automation within our technology worlds, which is all about process and invoice that we don't necessarily need things for people to do. So, so once I've managed to disabuse myself of that belief of uh, that all robots had to look like people, it was then let's investigate. And talking to Jack, there's a whole lot of fascinating areas about how this automation can work. And uh, there's a fascinating story to go through. So we're going to talk about this through two lenses as we walk through. There's the lens of the innovation of the robots and all of the robots. And then there's also the line of this is a startup business and how Jack's managed to develop a business with his partner if, to go from, from an idea to creating a product to getting that product out there and to using it and now growing the business and uh, developing it. So I think it should be a, a nice wide ranging discussion that we can uh, pick up on and please feel free to chirp in. And in that, we're got our loose five points that we always talk through uh, that, that we base this, this discussion around. So Jack's going to, after introducing himself, he'll talk about his life as an entrepreneur and how he's been involved in ventures from, from a very young age and uh, that he's just this type of, the type of guy that he is. Uh, we'll then talk about the robots and going into where the ideas and inspirations came from and the use cases and how it's evolving. Um, then the business itself will talk about housebots and where it's come from, how it's going, how you get the funding, how it's surviving, the type of work breaking into the construction market and buildings and maintenance. Loads of cases. We've got a few slides with a couple of videos that uh, we'll show at the appropriate times and then where the future is. But uh, Jack, without further ado, uh, welcome to the webinar and uh, I'll give you a minute to introduce yourself before we, we start the interrogation. Well, that sounds welcoming. <laughs> uh, cheers, Steve. <clears throat> so yeah, hi everyone, my name's Jack. Uh, currently, I am one of the co-founders and CEO of uh, a company called Housebots. Uh, as you can probably have guessed now, then Housebots is a robotics business based in Birmingham. Uh, and we make robotics uh, for everything to do with maintaining and protecting buildings and infrastructure. Um, how that actually came about is a pretty long story. Um, and starting from my background, uh, as, as Steve rightly points out, as somebody who's been tinkering with entrepreneurship since day one, um, I, uh, uh, since very, very young, kind of had that thing inside me, which was wanting to sell things and make money. I think that the, the very first example I can remember was being, uh, eight years old and getting my friends over to my grandma's house where we'd pick the vegetables from her garden and uh, try and flog them in the streets and various other things uh, going on, goings on uh, as I grew up, kind of in, in my blood, if you have. <laughs> um, we, uh, I got towards the end of, end of school and um, initially my plan was to, to head off to university to start studying. I was going to go and study maths and economics at university. And uh, at the very last minute, I uh, really it kind of uh, the penny dropped and I decided that for my personality, that wasn't going to work. And I'd much prefer to just get straight into the working world. So I got got started off uh, straight out of school working in sales. Um, I worked at IBM for a few years selling uh, mainframe computers and other large tech solutions. Uh, and then I moved to an FMCG company again, uh, selling uh, stuff. Um, I, around about this time, then uh, my co-founder, who now Harry, uh, he was studying uh, towards his engineering degree at university. And um, he was telling me one day over a beer, in fact, uh, which is how all good co companies start, that uh, he'd come up with this idea for a new method that you could climb up a wall uh, using, using robotics. Uh, and, you know, we had a bit of a, a to and fro over, over this beer and never really thought much of it. Uh, so I went back off to work and uh, at this time working at IBM uh, and uh, the eureka moment for me was 
when I kind of put two and two together about the amount of money and interest there were there was in general automation. Um, I think uh, one of the big things that we were doing was selling usually large software packages to banks or other corporates wanting to automate typically semi-skilled labor, um, uh, whether it be uh, through chatbots or, or, or whatever in, in uh, the automation phase. Um, but the, the, the thing that I didn't see was then that, uh, that taking its next step into automating dirty and dangerous tasks, but specifically automating uh, work at height in, in the construction industry. Um, you know, it's, you only have to walk around any city where you see huge scaffolding projects or cherry pickers or other forms of, of um, uh, work at height, which are fundamentally dangerous and expensive methods of doing things. Uh, so I, it really stood out to me as the, the perfect time for a want for increased automation, a market need which wasn't being fulfilled when it comes to specifically working at height. Mm. And it just so happened that one of my friends since about age 13 was the missing link in the form yeah. of a crazy mad inventor who could actually make a robot to, to, to help with that. Yeah. Um, so, so is this yeah. one of those classic in a garage moments? Well, building exactly. Stuff. Exactly. Yeah. So that was that was the next step. We um, uh, the very first thing we did was uh, was get into his garage. So we took over his parents garage for probably the best part of six months whilst I was still working full time. So I was uh, weekends and evenings going back to the garage and, and helping him design and make things uh, before we emerged with our, our first ever prototype um, that we could actually start showing people. <laughs> I love the idea of the, the garage business. It always, always works, always comes through. And, and within the, so did you, so where did you get all, where did you get all the components for to start building, building a robot? It's like one of the things I can imagine selling stuff and doing a, an entrepreneur, both thinking of selling things. I can think about other, but then thinking, where do you get the kit? Where do you go? Oh, I need this to make a robot. Sure. So um, uh, over the past um maybe even, even only four years, possibly five years, there's been a real revolution in accessibility for 3D printing. Um, you, can buy, uh, you can buy yourself a, a professional grade 3D printer for about 150 or 200 quid. Uh, and with access to a laptop, you can design anything you want and get printing it straight away. So that was the first thing that we did was, uh, club together our cash to buy a couple of 3D printers and uh, and start making things uh, from that. Uh, and then interestingly, um, uh, everything else is, is really quite low cost thanks to the advent of China um, it, when it comes to electronics. So you can buy uh, basically any electronics from Amazon or wherever you, where, where, wherever for pennies to get you started with your first prototype. And our first ever prototypes were really quite... Uh, Frankenstein, if you like, of you know, plugging things together, making sure that they resemble something that could slightly show promise, uh, okay. but ultimately it was never going to be a commercial solution. Um, uh, but that's that's what you've got to do to kind of show the the early early traction and proof in your idea. So yeah, yeah. So, my obvious question is, how many fell off the walls before you got the first one to actually start climbing? <laughs> oh yeah. Too many, <laughs> too many. Yeah, we um, uh, we actually went through uh, probably the best part of uh, thirty revisions of the entire design before we had something that reliably worked. Um, and you know, it's still being improved today. But but before that first one that we made was was about thirty revisions. So, Jack you know. said that um, entrepreneurship is quite a lonely journey. Mm. That, uh, you can see something which maybe not everybody else can see, in, especially in the early stages. Um, when did you discover? When did you discover that you'd cross that kind of that Rubicon where you and your partner were making something which you could see, which suddenly everybody else could see the potential of? Mm. When did you make that 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 landmark crossing? Sure. So. Um... Uh, basically everything that I believe about startups and specifically the type of startup that I'm trying to start um, can be summarized in a, a, a lovely book 
called The Four Steps to the Epiphany, um, which is uh, an interesting title, but uh, it basically walks through what's called the customer development model. And uh, if anyone's heard of it, then it's basically the phases that you go from having nothing but an idea through to running as many experiments as you possibly can to prove that your idea is onto something. Uh, and it starts from in its very basic sense to the very first thing is to write down what your hypotheses are in terms of what the product should be, what the market looks like, what problems you're solving for people, who your customer's gonna be, who's gonna buy it inside that customer, and, 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 through to running interviews with your customers, showing them the, your first prototype and collecting the feedback. How do you actually get the feedback uh, to make it valuable and not just people you know, blowing smoke up your ass um, uh, and all sorts of things like that. So from day one, everything that we did was kind of very calculated and, mm. um, just came down to uh, let's take our initial idea and try and prove by running whatever experiment we can that people actually want it and that this is something that they are happy to pay for. Uh, and that then unlocks your different stages of being able to access funding as well. So um, uh, taking a little step back, then our first ever investment in the business was personal, obviously. So we put a small amount of personal money in. Uh, alongside that, we won some competitions. So we won probably the best part of 50 grand in entrepreneurship competitions, uh, oh, which was um, yeah fantastic for us. And that was really that right. kind of enabled us to build our first ever prototype. Um, taking that money, we could, we could then take our prototype and run some of these experiments and feedbacks with potential customers. Uh, take that information and then that enable us to raise our first actual funding round, which um, I can talk about in a bit, but um, yeah, these kind of stages and running experiments for it to go from step to step. Well, since we're talking about uh, uh, investment, um, you know, you get something called angel investors nowadays. Uh, my experience is that they're not angels and, and they typically don't tend to invest. So <laughs> I don't know why they're, they're called that, but um, have you found the challenges of going into a professional stage of rounds of investment? Uh, how have you found that? So we, um, our, our first investment round was, uh, well, we, we had a fund that joined um, called the British Seed Robotics Fund, which, um, as imaginatively named, you can probably guess they invested in British robotics. Um, so we we took investment from them, and we actually took investment from a number of angels as well. Um, the two main angels in that round were um, people who had made all of their money in, in the construction industry and were already kind of interested in on the lookout for robotics in construction. Um, so that was our, our first investment round. Uh, we did probably... 250,000 in, in that amount. Um, and then we quickly followed that by um, taking on our first institutional investor who's actually a Silicon Valley based um, venture capital fund uh, who are one of the most active in hardware and robotics investments. Um, interestingly, the diligence process was uh, easier for the professional fund than it were the um, kind of junior slash um, angels uh, and that's because once you're you're a professional investor your whole life is uh, a massive game of risk and they're professional risk takers at the end of the day they know exactly how to calculate the risk in a startup and they understand exactly how to value these things and and you know when a good bet is and a bad bet is um, and so it's my preference especially is dealing with the kind of institutional and, and professional funds because that's what they do day in day out and uh, and understand it whereas um, we haven't but a lot of people I know have uh, can, can end up with investors or specifically angels who can be very emotionally attached because it's a different uh, it's a different type of investment you know if it's my money as opposed to a fund's money let's say well that's I guess that's the time when people are they're more worried about losing the money if it's their personal money in, at times like that. So I think that's where you get the attachment, don't you, at times? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. uh, I, I think as well, Jack's, you know, hit on it because he's experienced it. Um, it's appetite for risk. Um, a professional investor will have an understanding of what risk is and the fact that they repeatedly have to 
uh, evaluate and dive into risk every day makes them more familiar with that water. Mm. Uh, yeah. Angel yeah. investors, as you know, I mean, in my experience, angel investors want as little or zero risk as possible in their investment. They're not actually what they you know, might you might interpret them as you're applying as for an angel investment, i.e. early stage, higher risk. Um, you know, there's a big question mark on your future. They, they want to narrow that down and, they, you know, and angel investors will want to see some kind of uh, revenue stream, existing customers. They'll want to see IP having been protected. Presumably, Jack, you would have had to show how do you protect your idea? Uh, how, how is your invention, for instance, uh, protected against the mass market so um you know yeah. barriers to entry etc yeah but to, to help that then you you have um a number of fantastic schemes that the government has, has put in place like uh, seis and eis for, um, investments so for those who aren't familiar then seis is the seed enterprise investment scheme uh, if you're a qualifying uh, research-based startup, you can get SEIS approval. Uh, and what that means is that individual investors um, in your business can get an immediate 50% tax break on their investment to help with that risk. So uh, we actually did our entire first round under SEIS investment. So um, yeah, when we get the, the, the money, then said investor writes it on their tax return and gets a 50% um, uh, tax break tax break and then even better still if the investment goes to zero and for whatever reason the company um you know goes out of business then they get a further 50 percent of the remaining 50 percent. so really they're only risking 25 percent of their money because the rest of it comes back in tax breaks um which has been huge for for investment in um uh, young risky tech startups in the uk and has really kind of fostered a great ecosystem when it comes to that respect so, so to our audience, if any of you are involved or are thinking of uh, innovations and startups, SEIS That's and right, yeah. IS yeah, yeah. programs, get yourself registered for them because it makes you a hell of a lot more attractive yep, to yep. potential investors. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And there's a number of funds that will only invest in SEIS and EIS registered businesses. So, yeah. There's an interesting bit you mentioned earlier about when when you were going through the stages of development and testing the ideas and things like that, a bit that, that's often an issue with entrepreneurs is when they get the feedback, it's like somebody's calling their baby ugly at times. If it's, uh, you know, they, they come back and they say, yeah, but, and it sounds like you'd actually, because you've got that planned approach to doing it, you were always open the feedback and therefore were able to, to adapt and didn't take it personally as somebody thinking that your idea was bad and that just helped keep continue fueling the fire of your, your innovation that's right yeah yeah and it, it in fact that's um somebody calling your baby ugly uh can we call your baby ugly is a great thing that's that's an outcome that you want because then you know that you're maybe on a slightly wrong track or you need to change something or you need to reassess the hypotheses that you came up with um yeah just just because we're on the point now as as a Kind of soundbite to take away is there's a really good uh plenty of literature online about this thing called the the mum test and, and what the mum test is is it teaches you how to run interviews and feedback sessions uh that not even your mum can say is a good idea to uh, <laughs> and so the the difference is um let's say i've come up with a new idea for uh, a cooking app um if i went to my mum and said, oh, mum, you like cooking, don't you? You've got all these cookbooks. How about if those cookbooks were on an app? Would you use the app? Obviously, your mum's going to say yes, because she's your mum. Uh, whereas the way that you should really be positioning your cooking app is asking questions about uh, how often does she think about recipes? What does she look for when she's uh, when she's engaging with these things does she prefer it in a book format or does she ever go online you know and then you get the answers for you to drill, draw the conclusion that a cooking app might be a good idea but also anything else could be a good idea and so yeah the mum test is a very very good way of run, running interviews to get useful feedback for people i'm just going to change the backdrop actually because we have got a picture of your first product there uh, when it came i thought that'd be quite useful for people to be able to see some if who are, who are on and looking and just seeing something real and uh, yeah. you know it's those interesting facts down the left hand side even though you price in dollars but uh, 
from Birmingham. Is that the local currency in Birmingham these days? Uh, th- th- this was a, a deck I made for an American investor. So yeah, you, you gotta you gotta do what they want. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, it's a great thing to talk through. You know, I mean, just the cost differences as well for for what you're doing. So so take us through that first product. Then this uh, what what we're picturing here is. Where did you go and say, right, this is the first thing we're going to tackle. This is the first problem we're going to solve. Uh, this is how we're going to scale the benefits that we're going to get from it. Obviously, you have zero scaffolding and things like that, regardless what you're doing. But just uh, talk us through that sort of little journey as you were deciding, right, this is what we're going to hit first. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's even before that, then, as I say, it's, it starts with interviews. So we we... Uh, drew up our first ever list of um, who could potentially be clients for uh, uh, a solution for working at height. Um, Mm. We had the hypothesis that working at height was dangerous and expensive. uh, And who does that actually affect? So our first thing was to try and engage with construction companies. We thought that was a good area to to enter. Um, uh, We spoke to as many contractors as we could, as many subcontractors as we could across Uh, new build construction, all the way through to maintenance and repair of structures. Um, It turned out that the kind of most appetite and the biggest problem in work at height is felt in the the maintenance and uh, inspection industries with subcontractors um, typically spending around 50% of their budget on a maintenance project uh, if work at height's involved on Mm. the solution. So uh, your scaffolding or your cherry pickers or whatever. Um, and then obviously all of the hidden costs that come with it, with your uh, insurances for work at height, you know, what happens if something goes wrong? What happens if there's an injury? What about the danger? Uh, so our, our first customer base that we picked was uh, maintenance and uh, inspection subcontractors. Um, we st- then thought about a number of different solutions that we could provide uh, from everything through to uh, an easier way of setting up scaffolding. Uh, to uh, a couple of ideas we had around drones. So could you use drones to do X, Y, Z? Um, and again, testing these solutions, there's um, all sorts of different um, negatives and benefits of all of them. But the, the main reason that climbing robots won out as the solution uh, is that you, you're not bound by legislation. So drones can, in many cases, be a legislative nightmare. Uh, and a lot of the tasks that Uh, these maintenance and uh, inspection contractors do require extended periods of contact with a surface. Uh, So if you're painting, for example, you obviously need a lot of time being in contact with the surface and painting, or if you're taking uh, measurements on a concrete structure to find out the corrosion of the steel inside, then you need to be in contact with the surface the whole time. Uh, And so that sort of long duration task lends itself much more to be permanently stuck to a surface than it does being on a drone and trying to, I don't know, spot test things or or access it in a number of different ways. Um, So we then just went away and and started started, uh, improving and building and making our robots. So what you can see here is is our prototypes um, or our most recent prototype because it's it's constantly evolving. where the clever thing is actually how the robot sticks and climbs up different surfaces. So we've developed the technology for uh, rough surface climbing, overcoming obstacles, uh, climbing on any type of substrate, so whether that be magnetic or non-magnetic or, or whatever, you, what have you, uh, and also the, the smooth surfaces as well, which is a kind of previously mm. um, Uh, previously impossible task. So then uh, we're taking that robot, that kind of base climbing system that we've developed um, and uh, adapting it to as many use cases as we can from painting to uh, inspection to general repair works. Uh, We were just obviously talking about the pest control aspect and Mm. um, using using the robot for various um, uh, wasps nests is is one one area that a client has interest for using the robot for just anywhere where you would be sending people at a height which can lead lead to danger or expense yeah and i noticed on this slide so obviously the all surfaces is in bold so that implies that this is your your secret source in some ways is the all surfaces bit that's right that's that's the secret source so um on the market already, there's there's a you know climbing robots aren't a new thing. Um, mm. 
there's uh, they typically fall into one of two categories. One is magnetic or magnetism based. So they'll have some sort of magnetic track or magnetic wheels um, uh, for climbing stuff. Or the second category is, is some sort of suction cup or, or sealed area, uh, which only will work on a smooth surface because you're trying to slide over, um, yeah. slide over the surface. I think this is one of the things which has impressed me greatly, Jack, is you take a look at that picture and you have to think about it for a, a short while, certainly I did, because you think to yourself, okay, it's defying gravity, and you think, oh, it must be magnetism or something like that, and then you realize actually it's on brick. How, how is there magnetism on brick? <laughs> so, you know, it starts a chain of questions and queries, which eventually leads you to, wow, they're doing something there, which is genuinely innovative. And if you're using this, you know, your technology, your patent, you know, congratulations again to you and your partner. You've patented this unique way of uh, adhesion onto various surfaces, any kind of surface, and then climb up that surface. I mean, this opens up a whole world of use cases. And one of the things that I thought to myself is this is only limited really by imagination and yeah. money. So yeah. um, one of the things, anybody who's been involved in um, construction, even as a humble home homeowner, you'll know the price of something like scaffolding, for instance. Scaffolding is extremely expensive and over a long period of time as well. And if you're doing away with scaffolding in inspections or certification or some kind of maintenance task, that can be a real game changer in terms of cost. Yeah, yep, that's exactly right. <laughs> The three times faster that you mentioned on here, is that is that three times faster and actually executing the painting, say, or is that the whole job, including the assembly of scaffolding, disassembly? Yeah, that, that's everything, in, including yeah. the, the scaffolding. So, um, yeah, you'll typically budget on, on a work at height job where you've decided that scaffolding needs to go in, um, depending on what the action is that you're doing, but you, you'll typically be looking at some something like a third of the job to set up the scaffolding, time-wise this is, a third of the job to set up the scaffolding, a third of the job to do the task that you're doing and a third to take it down again. All yeah. uh, right, interesting. And what about the speed of operations and, and all that? It, it's pretty fast anyway it's to do it. So it's basically operating. So it does it at similar pace or slightly faster than the person doing it? So you're, you're limited by the attachment that you have. Um, right. You know, if, if, you, if you've got its, if it's got its painting gun, for example, which it does in those photos, then if you move any quicker, then you'll get a bad paint finish. But if you move any slower, you'll get a bad paint finish. So you have to, you know, versus a person, you have to move at about the same speed um, for, for that reason. Yeah. Is there use in something like this? And I'm Make a jump ahead here. I'm thinking of like removal of graffiti and stuff like that, and that type of thing on walls. Just seems like this is an ideal thing to. Yeah, work yeah. In interestingly, um, uh, something that we've been approached by and semi confidential at the moment is um, every time uh, some cool young person climbs up onto a railway bridge and uh, paints the graffiti up there. Yeah. Uh, when they want to remove it, they actually have to close the railway line because um, you can't just have somebody dangling off a bridge and a live railway line. Yeah. So uh, Network Rail and others spend a ridiculous amount of time and energy on railway bridge graffiti removal because they close the line. Um, <laughs> so as a potential idea, then with a robot, maybe you don't have to close the line. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's fascinating stuff. I'm really intrigued in that. So, so as, of these pictures, how much of this, are they all still of this robot because you got me intrigued with the 3d printing earlier uh, mm -hmm. how much of this is 3d printed as we would see in the pictures um so uh, we've advanced a little bit meaning that we don't do much 3d yeah. printing in, ha in house anymore yeah. um uh, we there's a number of metal components we design right. and make our own gearboxes and motors for example um they obviously get outsourced. Uh, it's one good good thing about being in mm. Birmingham is that we're an extremely industrial city, and uh, a lot of our uh, metal supplies, specifically, are actually just around the corner. Right. So um, we do a lot of CNC work, milling, turning of basic basic parts in metal. Uh, the enclosure in the outer bit that covers it is three D printed, as you can see there. Uh, the wheels are actually um, injection mold cast out of silicon. 
uh, various other pieces get 3D printed in it as well. Um, but uh, yeah, a number of different manufacturing techniques go into it nowadays. Yeah, fascinating, fascinating. So, a question. Sorry, are you gonna say something, Shay? Yeah, I'll just, uh, a question, please, Jack. So let's say the phone rings. Mm -hmm. um, one of your customers says, Jack, we've got a need for um, inspecting or painting uh, a particular building in a particular site. How quickly can you turn around that request? I mean, all things being equal. Yeah, how quickly can you get on site, set up your robot and then implement? Mm -hmm. So we're, we're yet to enter the full execution phase of our business. We're, we're still very much in, in test and trial with a number of hand-picked clients. So we've got um, probably five to 10 active clients that we work closely with. Uh, and a waiting list of people that I've had to say no to of probably 100 to 150 long. Wow. Um, which means that, um, that of those five and five to 10 that we're working with, uh, well, firstly, if you're going to call up, pick up and call, uh, call me, you'd have to be one of those five to 10. Um, but uh, we have regularly scheduled trials with them. So uh, everything from uh, just yesterday, actually, we were on a Zoom presentation with a client where we were showing them the robot uh, working on one of our lab walls and we were getting their feedback over Zoom uh, through to um, next week. We've got a scheduled live demonstration with a client um, again for kind of feedback and collection purposes. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's way more in, um, we're still in the experimental phase of proving our hypotheses and that they stack up so that we can hopefully if everything goes well, move to our, our next stage of investment and, and, uh, uh, we should be at the end of this year getting into that execution phase, but it's still very much the innovation trial and experiment phase now. Excellent. Everybody assumes when you do those sort of tests and trials and you know hypothesis checking um, that it's 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 almost focused on the negative, as if to find the things where it doesn't work. However, by doing this. Have you had any big surprises? Oh, well, actually, that's really good, and we could actually do that, and that's something really mega that we could go for. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all, all of that, the ideas for attachments for it have come from just you know general brainstorms of oh wow, you could do that with it. Um, an area that I didn't even consider is that um, a large number of uh, oil and gas storage tanks are made from stainless steel, and um, that means that the, it's not magnetic. Mm. And so um, oil and gas storage tank inspections, when they're not made from a ferrous substance, is a huge area that just came, that just came out of a demonstration where we were giving a demonstration to a client and they said, oh, wow, the penny has just dropped. We could use it for this. And it just opens up a new new avenue. So, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So you must be uh, building up a library of use cases, potentially. Yeah, yeah. The, tr the trouble is then then trying to pick between them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, which it just comes down to if people have their money where their mouth is. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a good place to be in, Jack, you know, with the um, 100, 150 potential customers out there who, who are interesting, interested in using your robots. That's, Definitely, that's a great yeah. Place to be. Yeah. What, what, whilst I haven't uh, yet. Uh, I can't boast about my my amazing sales skills, uh, but uh, it's it's good that uh, all all of our sales and, and leads are inbound. I mean, we, we do zero outreach just because people hear about the solution and hear about its wow. uh, innovation, and then you know I, I, we we already kind of can't work with enough people, so we need to kind of go slowly, effectively, which is a shame. But that's what you're limited by doing as, as a startup is you know, mm. improving things slowly and, and thoroughly. And you've got the time, haven't you? You've got the buffer of the patent protection around your innovation. So yeah. it allows your investors and yourself the luxury of some R&D time to perfect your offering before you go to market. That's it, yeah, that's it. And um, uh, it's, it's really what, it's what investors look at at each stage of investment uh, as well. You know, you'll typically raise a small amount in your, in your kind of seed funding, so I mean, to, to date, we've probably done about um, 600,000 in private investment, and we've, we've done about 400,000 in grants as well, um, uh, as, a, as a kind of small starting amount. But then each investment round you go into the future, you'll hopefully try and raise more and more money 
as you've proved more and more of your hypotheses or not. Um, and that, that's kind of how, how you, you start moving. And then you end up hearing of these companies raising hundreds of millions of dollars because they proved a number of their hypotheses that they're, they're working towards. Is there a is there a limit to the size you can get the robots to? Is that controlled by something science? I presume physics at some point is going to come into it, but uh, yeah, not not particularly. I mean, it's 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 mainly just what becomes a practical size. That that robot you can see in front of you weigh, weighs about 10, 10 kilos. So right. um, uh, the bigger you go, obviously the heavier you become. Um, but in, uh, also, you, you you get more more you know suction and more adhesion to your surface the bigger that you are as well. So it's a it's a trade off. So yeah, ten kilos is pretty heavy, is pretty especially heavy. when it's defying gravity, right? Yeah, yeah, it's going up heavy. a vertical wall. Yeah, I mean it 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 does look miraculous, but that that robot has got about forty five kilos of force into the surface, so you're you know you're not pulling it off very easily, and. Oh, what was the other thing? You mentioned something earlier um, about, as well as the surfaces, it was either earlier or when we were talking before, and you mentioned obstacles as well, yeah. being able to deal with obstacles. Yeah. Go on. How, how do you deal with it? When, when you say deal with obstacles, does that go around it, go over it, do whatever? I, I think, if you just go to the next slide, I think there should be something there. Um, yes, I've got there. So as, as I've spoken about them, the kind of special thing about the robot is the way that it sticks and, and, and climbs. Um, for any Formula One fans or, or other open wheel racing fans out there, then um, you'll be familiar with the concept of the ground effect, which is effectively air is moving quicker under the car than it is over the car. Uh, and therefore you've got a whole region of low pressure underneath the car, so the car sticks itself to a surface. Uh, our robot does the exact same thing, uh, but instead of moving at 200 miles an hour, there's a fan to create that airflow uh, and, and you know, simulate that pressure difference, which therefore and um, critically means you don't have to have a sealed area for your robot to create its, its vacuum or its suction. Uh, and, uh, and then you can climb over rough things because you're not trying to maintain a seal or a suction area. Uh, and the same for, for when you're overcoming obstacles as well as that you've, you've got that offset from the wall that you can you can climb uh, you can climb with. Oh, so question from uh, presumably the umbilical carries the power and the liquid to be sprayed. So there must be a scaling limit based on suction power and weight being dragged up. Thanks, John, for that one. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you've got about 30 meters of uh, umbilical before it becomes too heavy, which is about 10 stories. Um, however, in many cases, we have a tethering system from the top anyway. Uh, and if you tether your power from the top as well, then you can, in theory, run unlimited because you can take your weight off, uh, off the top of the building as well. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a project that we're working on next month, which is actually a, a, an eight story building where we'll be feeding the umbilical from the roof. Right. And that upside down one that's just gone through on the video is uh, amazing. <laughs> I didn't think that could work, but uh, I guess it's the same principles, isn't it? It's just that whole... Yeah, yeah. And you've got, you've got your 42 kilos of available suction, so you can go upside down. Yeah, wow, I do like that. Um, I think there, there might be a couple of photos on the next slides of just it, it being used in a few more places as well. Yeah, let's go. This is one which talks about your attachments. Yeah, you, as, as Shade says, you, you're limited only by your imagination, spraying systems or surveying equipment or whatever the robots are about. sensors. Yeah, yeah you, you've got about six kilograms of available attachment space. So most handheld things will end up being around six kilos that you can, you can attach to the robot. Wow. And I've got another couple of use cases that we can show. Here's a one, which is... Uh... Yeah, so this is just a follow on from a photo earlier. This is a, um, a large area of our business at the moment is exterior protective paints. Um, in this example, we're spraying a uh, completely clear waterproofing brick coating, which uh, it, it goes on white, but dries clear and uh, means that the brick is then protected from rain and uh, another water ingress, which is um, uh, really uh, a really large product in 
uh, older properties, especially solid wall properties. Um, Can you do uh, heavier uh, materials like um, render? Uh, yeah, you, you definitely could do. I think if, if render can be sprayed, which I guess you can get rend sprayable render, then yeah, you can you can stick it on the robot. I mean, there's there's really nothing special about the spraying system it's using. It's a completely standard. Industry standard, yeah. Yeah, it's a good thing. So we, we see it going <coughs> up and down in a straight line. Mm -hmm. uh, this is going. This is like Steve's six year old question. You know, assume that I'm an idiot. How do we get it to cover the whole of the wall? Uh, what do you mean? Well, to, to actually do, how do we make it track that whole wall to spray the whole wall? So it goes vertically because it's going up and down. How do we make it go side to side? Right. Yeah. So so it it'll in this example it'll come down from the bottom of that pass. Uh, it'll end up moving slightly to the left and then it will drive up directly next right. to where it's just painted and come down again with an overlap. So right. you end up going like that. Yeah. Right. So do you set that as part of the planning of the, yeah, exactly. the job? Yeah. All right. See, I thought it was just a simple question. It must be quite a similar uh, algorithm to, you know, like machine cutting. Yeah, it so is. Like, yeah. yeah. So yeah. the, the the computer look at the surface area and then work out an algorithm for yeah. movement yeah. to maximize, or I should say, mo make the most efficient use of time and energy. Yeah, T turn it into slices. Yeah. yeah, or you can use it manually as well. So, yeah, either way, that'd be fun. Convert fun with a little controller, making it whiz around the wall. Yeah, uh, you, could get, you could get all of our teenage children instead of playing on Fortnite to do something useful. Get out there. And paint the side of the house. Yeah. <laughs> There's another use case then. Yes, yeah, so this was a project that we were working on uh, last week, in fact, underneath Spaghetti Junction, um, with the robot climbing up um, uh, one of the columns. On the front of it, it had a, um, well, it's got a camera on the front for just looking at surface um, uh, imperfections or defects, cracks, blah, blah, blah. Um, right. And an additional sensor, which is is uh, send it's sending ultrasound pulses into the concrete, and it's looking for delaminations and voids inside the concrete. Um, because as steel rusts inside your concrete, then uh, you, you can you can get delaminations in in the concrete, and that's when you know a piece of concrete falls falls off the front. Um, so this this particular pillar is about eight meters tall, I think. And uh, the way that they would have typically inspected it is, is climb up there and, and um, scaffold it. Wow, and if you've got to do that many of those pillars? Yeah, well, just under, if anyone's had the pleasure of walking under Spaghetti Junction or any part of the M M M6 for that matter, then you'll know there's hundreds and hundreds of these, uh, these support Are beams. Are they trying to speak it? Wow, it's just, uh... Yeah, just to be able to cover all of that by just doing it, then you move to the next one rather than have to disassemble, assemble all the scaffolding to do it. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that's quite, uh, quite fascinating, actually. At first, I thought that it actually done the painting at the bottom, and I was thinking that is quite impressive. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it's not a silent graffiti artist. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so... And this is, this is great, and obviously the next thing is getting just bigger and better and, and bigger... Uh, how many robots do you have at the minute? And you know, I guess you've got to build a stock of them, don't you, to be able to then scale and scale the business even more? Yeah. So um, uh, a, again, in in the kind of we, we draw a lot of similarities to F one, <laughs> in that we probably have uh, three robots, it, which are kind of ready for action. But mm -hmm. um, in the same way that Formula One does, is that all of them are constantly. Uh, evolving prototypes so right. there's there's always a number of different robots that we have in our workshop which are either being improved or tested or we've added a different gearbox design and we want to see if we can get extra reliability on it or xyz uh, and then obviously if those pass those tests are successful then it gets pushed on to one of the kind of live versions that we have mm. available it's interesting you use the analogy of um, formula one mm. um, a lot of other process-based industries, R&D involved industries, actually use learnings from Formula One, how they do things in order to trickle into their industry. I, I know, for instance, with Formula One, the teams are innovating on an almost daily basis. They're reviewing all of the telematics, all of the 
um, you know, data from you know thousands of sensors on the on the circuit, on the the actual car itself, etc. And they're constantly refining airflow, you know, uh, fuel air mixtures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, ad infinitum to constantly evolve the performance of that car in yeah. any given scenario. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, that's exactly what what we do. Um, we do the exact same thing, and then chuck in um, uh, customer requests or changes, or you know, if if, yeah. if something needs to be slightly different because it doesn't so that quite. That's a great customer. interest. So you also incorporate customer, sorry, customization requests from your customers? Uh, potentially. I mean, it's... it's. Um, it depends on the use case, right? And Yeah, I think the, the, the main thing to be um, uh, cognizant of, uh, and I, ha I hate this quote because it doesn't work in, in m most situations, but... Um, uh, I think somebody must have made it up that Henry Ford said, if I asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses, um, yeah. uh, which I can't believe that Henry Ford did actually say. But anyway, uh, what that what that means in this case is, is that uh, specifically feature requests, you have to be very careful as to what the customer is actually telling you. Um, you know, if, if it's a feature request, do they actually mean that that's the feature that they want or do they want the outcome that that feature mm -hmm. allows? Uh, and so most of the time we'll take the feature request and, you know, thanks for giving it to us. But typically there's a number of ways that you can fulfill that need. Um, We're familiar with that. We're, yeah. you, know, <laughs> you know, Steve and I, we work in a, uh, an industry where sometimes customers, what they ask us to do is they're making a large investment in, a, you know, wonderful new capability. What they ask us to do is let us do what we're doing today in the new system. Yes. <laughs> so we're spending lots of money with, you know, oh, investing in, in uh, something wonderful, but can you please get us to do the same thing in the new oh, system? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Well, we understand. Yeah. yeah. Question from me. Uh, it's just occurred, just really occurred. So is the business, is the business about providing the service or is the business about providing robots and therefore will housebots become a business that sells robots and develops robots or will it be a, a business that provides a service using robots that you develop? Mm. Uh, that's, a, that's a good question and um, what I'll start it by is uh, making it very clear what a startup is. Um, <laughs> I think what people what people seem to forget is and uh, what my dad always asks me is, oh, are you making any money? Um, uh, and the definition of a startup is, is pretty much a business, a thing that is trying to find a repeatable business model so that it can become a company. Mm -hmm. And a company is an organization that already has a repeatable business model and is executing on it. So really what it means is that all of our life is spent on how do we eventually become a company by finding a repeatable and scalable business model. Yeah. Right now, the easiest way for us to do that is to provide the service. So we turn up with the robot and the operator and we um, provide that job. Um, one of our hypotheses that we were testing is that people would want to purchase robots from us yeah. and it's looking like that that's going to be true. Um, so that will probably be ending up being our scalable and repeatable business model is either sales or leasing mm -hmm. robots to other users. Um, but right now, uh, especially our early clients and our trial clients, they're not actually interested in the robot, they're interested in the outcome. So we just provide the service to make it easier for everybody. Yeah. That's yeah. a great question, yeah. Yeah, I just thought, I thought, mm, that's interesting, at which point, so you're still evolving as you walk well, I, I imagine there's going to be quite a few tradespeople who are either going to be displaced or have their uh, service model disrupted by these vertical climbing robots. So, great question, Steve. You know, do those uh, tradespeople, for instance, adopt the robot and then incorporate it into their service? So they amend their business model to suit the fact that technology has moved on. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think that's what's what's going to have to happen, really. <laughs> and it's great for me. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, you're almost create you are creating a new space, which is the act of a startup, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> which is creating something new and actually get people questioning. And sometimes <laughs> you create a solution, and people have to realise what the problem is that's actually being fixed. 
at times. I've, I've got my ultimate quote I use all the time. You know, is this not not in this one, but uh, is this a solution looking for a problem? And you see some of these people, and that typically is when you get some of those personal entrepreneurs and personal inventors that actually do just build a solution that doesn't have a problem. Um, yeah. And they don't take the feedback. And I think the way that you've gone and developed all of this through the whole, uh, you know, we, we got an idea, let's follow it, let's follow it, let's see what our customers think, let's see how it works, let's see what other people think, investors think, and and then take the feedback as well. It's phenomenally mature. And uh, yeah, I like it's, it, it just, yeah, it, you can see why you're, you're actually making, making headway because it's all about, well, let's see it evolve. And you keep using the term, it's evolving, it's prototypes, it's evolving. Mm -hmm. And I think... Uh, I think you will get to that point where you actually get to the become uh, a company. Yeah, we, yeah. yeah, and we appreciate your definition of startup versus active trading yeah. company. I yeah, think yeah. that's that's critical in that you are a startup, you are developing your business model, and when you get to a secure business model which you can exploit commercially, then you become a trading company. That's, that's yeah. right. That's exactly it. Yeah. And I think that the, the robot is just at the moment, it just happens to be the, the pinnacle of what we've, we've ended up on. You know, uh, we could have ended up with any product mm -hmm. really. And we, we may still end up with any product in the future. It just so happens that that's where all of our feedback has led to at this point mm -hmm. is a climbing robot. Yeah. Because interestingly, usually the last point that we always have, and I always have it on the five point slide, is the crystal ball. Your entire reason for existing, you are a crystal ball because you're actually every yeah. day, aren't you? You're, you're, you yeah. are a crystal ball. There's a compliment you're not going to get every week. But, <laughs> but, but you're, you're looking into it all the time. You're always looking at the future because you're evolving. And yeah. it's like to say what's next. Well, it's, it's what's next with what you currently have. Not yeah, yeah. I've got to think of my next big thing. Yeah, exactly. I think uh, see, see, seeing as though this webinar has become... Uh, uh, a good place for great quotes, then I'll add another quote, which, which is um, Jeff Bezos has a quote, which is uh, stubborn on vision, but flexible on details. And uh, in our case, then we're very stubborn on the fact that we fully believe that work at height cannot carry on in the way that it currently does. I just can't see any future 50 years, 100 years, 500 years from now that we still send people up structures on scaffolding or ladders of cherry pickers uh, and i think we're very stubborn on that vision of that's yeah. that's that's where we've got to be and where we've got to get to um how we get there it, it, it depends on on how our customers want to interact with us and how we're what the actual product is going to be but ultimately we're working towards a, a future where people don't have to leave the ground to climb up scaffolding to inspect and maintain our buildings and infrastructure. And that's a great ambition Brilliant. and that's a great aspiration. And if I might say, um, since we're on quotes, uh, <laughs> there's one that from Samuel Beckett that comes to mind, especially considering your current model, your startup phase, which is, have you ever tried, ever failed, no matter? Try again, fail again, fail better. Mm. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Definitely Great quote. Agree. I love that quote because it really does talk about iterative, you know, evolving innovation. And, you know, for all those people who've had innovative ideas and are entrepreneurs at heart, you'll know that failure and trying again and, and failing again, these are part of the oxygen which innovation breathes. Absolutely. Definitely. Absolutely. And I'm conscious of time, uh, we're really yeah. near the bottom of the hour. Uh, brilliant conversation and thanks for your time, Jack. That's been absolutely That's fascinating. Yeah. And, uh, thanks to everybody for taking part. If there's any questions, any further questions before we do the wrap up, um, please fire them in the, in the chat box. Uh, if not, we'll move on and quickly look at the resource page for this week that has been pulled together. Yeah. So thank you. Um, thank you from, from myself as well, Jack. That was really, truly fascinating. And, you know, congratulations to you and your partner and your team. Uh, you're doing something which genuinely looks amazing and we wish you every success. Um, if I may, I'll, I'll draw everybody's attention to the new normal resource page for Climbing Robots. You'll see Jack's um, bio there. 
Uh, nice smiley photo there, Jack. Well done. <laughs> and you've got the contact details for myself and Steve underneath if you need to get in touch with us on today's topic or any of our previous 46 weeks. On the left hand side, you'll see two use cases which uh, Jack and the team have shared with us house spots on exterior wall painting and on warehouse painting. So it's going into a little bit more detail showing what house spots have been doing, those particular use cases. We've also got in the field of robotics, if you look on the right hand side, uh, four individual columns on entrepreneurs, funding, robots, and house spots in particular, further links to each one of those um, subjects. And since funding was such an uh, interesting topic, we're grateful, Jack, thank you for uh, detailing that out further for anybody who's interested. Uh, at the bottom of the page, you'll see um, some further uh, thought leadership and some white papers from the likes of Deloitte, Forbes, McKinsey, etc., which you can dive deeper into the subject again. And on the left hand side, uh, ladies and gents, the next week's webinar, we invite you to please join us on a pillar of customer centricity. So we're going to be focusing on the customer. How do you focus uh, on the customer and create great customer experiences? How do you get your organization to pivot around your customer, both in terms of process, technology, and people? So with that, I'd like to say thank you to all of our uh, at attendees, our audience members for this week. Thank you very much for joining the new normal webinar. Thank you again to Jack for collaborating with us this week, Jack, much appreciated. And thank you to the new normal webinar team, Lucas, uh, Joanne, Claire, et cetera. Thank you very much for our team for supporting us each week. Over to you, Steve. Yeah, thanks very much. I think you thanked everybody. I thank once again, Jack, great to have you on and uh, look forward to coming back when uh, when you are a company. <laughs> when they're not too Definitely distant. One day. Yeah, we look forward to that, Jack. When they're not too distant future. Yeah, and when you're suddenly lovely. painting the walls of various places. Yeah, it, it, brilliant, really fascinating. And really good to see something young and up and coming and, and, and really different out there. Um, <laughs> so next week, we have uh, Claire Bailey joining us again for customer centricity. So whether we get a word in edgeways is another matter, but I'm sure we'll have a great time. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thanks to everybody. It's really great to continue. Next week, we move on to week 48. And have a great week and look forward to seeing you all again next Wednesday, same time, same place. Thanks very much.